Great, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for waking up for those of you who are jet lagged like myself. Uh, let me tell you about this paper by first um, setting the broader context into which this work fits, namely that of sparse representations. So this is a powerful idea that's had a big impact across many fields, but the starting point is really the observation that many types of data turn out to be sparse in an appropriately chosen basis. This will be the setting for this talk. So let me describe this in a bit more detail. So for our purposes, a set of data will be a collection of vectors in Rn. You can think about it as a collection of images or other types of signals. And the important thing is that for some dictionary, which is just an n by m matrix, we can write b sub i is the product of a times x sub i. Here I'll refer to a as the dictionary. It's overcomplete if there are more columns than rows. And I'll refer to x sub i as the representation of the data. Now for a given dictionary, there are of course many choices for how we could represent a given uh, piece of data. But really what we'll be interested in today is looking for some notion of a simple representation, if it exists. So in particular, a sparse one, one with at most k non-zeros. So many of you now may be familiar with things like sparse recovery, which is really the setting where A is known and BI is known and we'd like to compute a sparse X sub I if it exists that solves the linear system. Now dictionary learning instead is the very natural generalization uh, from a learning context to the, the setting where A is unknown. So the basic question we'll ask is can we learn A from random examples? Can we automatically fit the basis to our data? and find a basis that enables a sparse representation if one exists. So before I get into the details of the actual stochastic model we'll study, let me tell you a little bit about some of the history and applications of dictionary learning. So it's also referred to as sparse coding. You'll hear that often. Now as you might expect, it has many applications in things like signal processing and statistics, where of course, you know, hand-designed dictionaries, which are various families of wavelets, play a big role. So you'd expect that automated tools for finding bases are also powerful. And they play a key role in some of the fundamental tasks like denoising, edge detection, and super resolution, and also block compression. Now their uses in machine learning follow a slightly different pattern where the idea is that really sparsity is used as a regularizer to enforce that you're finding a simple model so that you hope when you learn a classifier on top of it, it generalizes well. It's even played a key role in some recent work in deep learning, which really takes it to another extreme, where instead of just looking for sparse representation, you're looking for composing sparse representations. And curiously, the first introduction of this work was not from any of these fields, but was from computational neuroscience, where the idea is that if you apply dictionary learning to a collection of natural images, it turns out that what you end up with are filters that have a lot of the same properties that the neural response patterns do in the visual cortex. So uh, now let me actually get into what the stochastic model is. Now, of course, there's a long history of sparse recovery, but I just want to summarize it and tell you one result, because we'll only be interested in studying dictionary learning in cases where we can perform sparse recovery. It only makes sense to try and learn dictionaries, which afterwards you can then use the dictionary to actually perform sparse recovery. So with that in mind, there's actually this <clears throat> slightly less known work on sparse recovery, which I think is really beautiful work by Donahoe and Stark and Donahoe and Quo on what are called incoherent dictionaries. So there's a really nice and general framework that captures many things that were studied before as special cases. The idea is to define a parameter mu called the incoherence, which measures the max over all pairs of columns of the inner products between them divided by root n. So the point is that the smaller mu is, the more uncorrelated the columns are. And as it turns out, the easier it is to perform sparse recovery. And in particular, this work really clarified a lot of the work that happened in signal processing beforehand because people had studied specific dictionaries and studied recovery for them, things like spikes and signs, which turn out to just be a special case because they're in fact incoherent. So the main work was that first of all, Donahoe and Stark and Donahoe and Quo proved that information theoretically, you can recover unique solutions because in fact, if X is K sparse, then if K is at most root N over two mu, then in fact, X is the uniquely sparsest solution of this given linear system. So it's at least uniquely defined. And moreover, algorithmically, you can find it too, because in fact, L1 minimization does the trick. So I want to emphasize this point because many of you are probably mostly familiar with things like the restricted isometry property and compressed sensing, which I would argue that in fact, that's a little bit more applicable to settings where you get to choose A, and then you can work up to linear sparsity. 
whereas a much richer family of dictionaries turn out to be incoherent, and it's a much more natural setting to study when you think about the dictionary as something you want to learn that you don't have control over, but it's intrinsic to the problem type. So now, you know, with this sort of goal in mind that we want to study dictionary learning in cases where we actually can solve sparse recovery, well, what cases can we actually solve sparse recovery? The first one is a rather simple case for sparse recovery is, well, if A itself has full column rank, then I can certainly find sparse solutions because I can forget about the fact that they're sparse and just solve the linear system. It turns out that the dictionary learning problem here is much more interesting, and there was this beautiful work in last year's cult by Spielman, Wang, and Wright, which informally, I'll state it for now, there's a polynomial time algorithm to learn dictionaries which have full column rank, provided that the sparsity of the observations you observe is about root n. And the model in which they studied it is the natural stochastic model you would think. So there's some unknown dictionary which we'd like to learn, some you know, basis which enables a sparse representation. And what we observe are random samples of the form a times x, where x is chosen to be k-sparse by definition. We choose its support uniformly at random among all sets of size k. And condition on its support, we choose the non-zero values independent. So I'll mention that what's nice about these types of models and these types of results is that they tend to work in much broader, you know, they're not too brittle to these types of stochastic assumptions. So this is in contrast to things like independent component analysis that are quite brittle to their assumptions. Now the main work that we consider in this paper is to try and generalize the, to get algorithms for overcomplete dictionaries. Remember that these are dictionaries which have more columns than rows. And the reason for really considering these dictionaries is that these are the ones that have played the key role in a lot of signal processing and statistics. It's because overcomplete dictionaries are more flexible. When you get to choose more columns than rows, you can better fit your basis to a given collection of data. So in this sense, overcomplete dictionaries turn out to be more expressive in terms of what families of signals you can sparsely represent using them. And the main result here is, well, we consider this case where A is incoherent, going back to this work of Donahoe and Stark and Donahoe and Quo. And remember that they were able to get sparse recovery as long as k is about root n over 2 mu. And that was exactly the right information theoretic threshold. Beyond that, x is not necessarily the uniquely sparse solution. So our main work is in the same stochastic model. We're able to do dictionary learning for almost the same sparsity. So instead, k goes up to root n over mu log n. So we're losing an extra log n factor and getting almost up to the Donahoe Huo bound. And um, I'll mention briefly that uh, what I'll show you, actually the sort of main technical point that I want to get across in this talk is that actually the main connection is between this problem and a purely graph theoretic question about overlapping clustering and random graphs. See, most of the heuristics for dictionary learning they have this flavor of alternating minimization where you guess one side and compute the other, fix one and alternate back to the other. So there's really a chicken and egg problem of if you knew the dictionary, you could find the sparse representation and vice versa. And really the question will be motivated based on if we don't know the dictionary, what can we still learn about the representation beforehand? That's the sense in which we'll get an overlapping clustering problem. I'll mention that independently and concurrently, Agarwal et al., which will be presented in this conference, uh, gave an algorithm for learning incoherent over complete dictionaries with quite different techniques uh, that works up to k equals n to the quarter over mu. So now let me quickly tell you about the connections to overlap and clustering. This is the main sort of technical points that I want to get across. <coughs> so remember that what I really want to understand is what can we learn about the representations without knowing the dictionary? And let me start off with a basic question. So what if I give you two samples, b and b prime? which have representations x and x prime, then a natural thing we could ask is, do x and x prime, do their supports intersect? Is there a common column of the dictionary that they both contain and use in the representation? So now let me denote uh, by white squares the zeros and black squares the non-zeros. So indeed here they have an intersection. And moreover, if we take x and x prime and take their inner product, it's easy to see that if that inner product is non-zero, they definitely have an intersection. Now, if it's zero, we don't really know because you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe they do and we just had the wrong cancellation and they happen to be zero. But the main point about what makes dictionary learning easier in the incoherent case is that there are these various uncertainty principles that are really the basis for sparse recovery. I won't get into those. 
But what they in essence show, the corollary for our purposes, is that for k sparse vectors x and x prime, it turns out that with high probability, the inner product between b prime and b turns out to be very close to x and x prime. So really, the way I want you to think about this is just by giving access to the samples, by taking their inner product, we get an answer to a simple pairwise test. We should think about it as now if we build a graph on the samples and connect pairs of samples whose inner product is at least a half in magnitude, we should think about it as a simplified random process just for the purpose of this talk that really the probability of an edge between B and B prime is zero if they don't intersect in their supports and let's say it's half if they do. So let's pretend this is our random graph model. And now let's get to the main meat. So the point is where are the clusters in this overlapping clustering problem? Well, we can look at all of the examples, all the samples B, where X sub I is non-zero. We can call that a cluster CI. Now, the key point is that this is a little bit different than the standard clustering and random graphs model because these clusters are overlapping. After all, CI and CJ, there are plenty of examples which have both XI not equal to zero and XJ not equal to zero. So these clusters will have considerable overlap. And really, the main question is, can we find these clusters efficiently in this random graph model? And the main starting point is the answer to this technical question. Think about the following thought experiment. What if I gave you three examples with representations x, x prime, and x double prime, and I told you that pairwise, each of their supports intersect? So there's one cluster that contains both x and x prime. There's one cluster that contains both x and x double prime, and one cluster that contains x prime and x double prime. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's one cluster that contains all of them together. So that's the main question, is, is this the scenario from our pairwise tests, or is this the scenario where they just happen to intersect in different clusters? It's the fact that the clusters are overlapping that makes this an interesting question. And the main point is that actually we can use fresh examples to be able to figure out which of these two cases occur. So think about it as this thought experiment. The first case is where they all three do intersect in one column. Well, what it means is how easy is it for a new sample Y to come along and hit all three of them pairwise? All Y would have to do is it would have to contain this one element. So the probability that Y intersects all three is at least K over M because we're choosing K sparse vectors over a domain of size M. Yet in contrast, now if we have three that don't intersect in a common intersection point, but they pairwise do, well, the key point is that with high probability, if you take any pair of samples, their common intersection will be constant size at most C. And then you can show through a simple combinatorial argument that the probability Y intersects all three is about O of K cubed over M squared. So what this allows us to do is just by counting the number of examples that hit all three together, we can give a simple triple test that'll distinguish between do these triples have a common intersection or do they not? Now we'll need higher order tests for the real version, which I won't get into. But essentially I claim that this really solves our overlapping clustering problem. So what if we take this test as a primitive? The fact that we can answer these sorts of queries, do these triples have a common intersection or not? Now how can we build the entire cluster? What we could do is we could take a pair of examples, x and x prime, and compute all the x double primes, which that triple satisfies the test. What that really outputs is a union of clusters corresponding to the intersection of the support of X and the support of X prime. So in general, this triple test gives us a way to output clusters, which the minimal elements will actually be the true overlapping clusters we're looking for. After all, for each cluster, there'll with high probability be some pair that uniquely identifies it, some pair X and X prime, which the intersection between them is exactly I. So when we do the triple test for that, we'll get only the cluster CI. So at the end of the day, we can clean it up just by outputting inclusion-wise minimal sets in this way. And as I mentioned, in order to actually get up to this Donahoe-Huo bound of roughly root n over mu, we have to use higher order tests and analysis through essentially piercing numbers, but I'll, I'll take that offline. And what I really want to emphasize is that now our problem is easy. Once we have some idea of what the representations look like, it's easy to get unbiased estimators for the dictionary columns. In fact, let me give you two different ways of doing it. So the first one is what if we can take these clusters, CI, which are all the examples where XI is non-zero, and what if we can partition this cluster into the things where XI is greater than zero and where XI is less than zero? This in turn, we would just have to average 
one of these subclusters and you would get an unbiased estimator of AI. That's one way to do it. In fact, you can even go back to some of the popular approaches in practice, things like KSVD that I won't get into, which you could even just take these clusters where X of I is non-zero. And the intuition is that if you look at the direction of largest variance, that should somewhat be in the direction of AI because you're oversampling the things that use that column. So that should be the direction of largest variance roughly. And then finally, we show that alternating minimization works when we're close enough to the true dictionary. So what that allows us to do is eventually get a geometric rate of convergence for the decay in our error. That's what allows us to do things like get log one of Repsilon for the dependency and the sample complexity and the runtime. All right, so I guess I'm, how much, what's the time? Two minutes, all right. Uh, I guess I'll just say thanks and take questions. So this was, um, I hope I at least emphasize the main points about why dictionary learning is natural. I think incoherent is really the right place to study these things. And really, I think there's an interesting connection between uh, dictionary learning and overlapping clustering and random graphs. So I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, thanks. Thank you.